Okay, everyone. Uh, my name is Johanna, and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar that will be about a recent cyber supply chain attacks and how you can secure your infrastructure. Uh, but I won't be the one who tells you all these solutions, uh, but it will be my colleagues, Sam Sami Hithainen and Magnus Kullström. Uh, who will tell you all about this. So uh, with that said, I would like to give the word to Sami. I'd like to say that uh, you can uh, write questions. Uh, maybe you can, Johanna, say something about that also. And we will go to you at the end, right? Yes, exactly. If you have any questions, you can write them in the chat. And uh, in the end, uh, we will read them up to Sami and he will uh, answer them for you. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. So. So what we're about to discuss today is, is um, about um, how you can secure your infrastructure for, for cyber supply chain attacks. And uh, um, it's a hot topic currently. Uh, you can read it all about in the news. So, and then that's why also uh, kind of um, there is all sorts of instructions also available how to do, how do you secure your infrastructure your systems your critical systems your critical data and that's why we thought that it's it's good to give some kind of uh, advice uh, what you should maybe concentrate on on in your own organization so one of the um, actors or parties that give good instructions is NIST instructions is NIST and you can see in this picture um, a NIST kind of a takeaway from, from NIST supply, supply chain risk management guide. So kind of this, this is from, from that guide. And then here you can see kind of that it's global. Uh, we're talking about global things. Supply chains are currently growing more global and, and especially the, uh, the uh, let's say both the traditional supply chains, but also the, the cyber supply chains. And, uh, ENISA has just in July released a threat landscape uh, survey or analysis guide to supply, supply chain attacks. And um, this is a good guide because, uh, and then it's a basis also for this uh, presentation because uh, this gives um, clear terminology, kind of uh, what is the cyber supply chain attacks and also kind of uh, so that you, you know, people can get kind of um, mutual reference in and uh, when discussing about these things because it's not so clear what is uh, actually a supply chain and especially a cyber supply chain attack but but in anyhow supply chain is uh, of course a big ecosystem you have uh, uh, people or, or organizations producing something we need to deliver them and and when we deliver something we also need to use, uh, or, or uh, companies need to use uh, providers uh, and, and still uh, some kind of resellers or, 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 or any other means to, to, to kind of deliver the stuff uh, to customers or users or whatever. And, and in, when we talk about cybersecurity, the supply chain is a bit different, although kind of the same. But then we talk about hardware and software and that sort of things and usually IT systems and, and eventually the actual data that we need to protect. So, and in this sense, um, they are both connected, but still they are a bit different. So what is the terminology, which is now based on the ENISA, ENISA report? Um, we have a supplier, of course, uh, who supplies the product or service or, or, or software or whatever. Uh, supplier has assets uh, which they, they protect by themselves and also which they use to produ produce the um, um, stuff that they want to deliver. Then we have customers uh, which use and consume the uh, products or services uh, that the suppliers produce and then we have of course the most important thing in this context today is the customer assets and in the right you can see it's a just picture uh, from the 
Iran, Iranian nuclear power plant, which is kind of related to the Stuxnet. If I think that's familiar to all, but kind of you see that uh, it's just a small uh, uh, scale model from that one. But uh, that's important because it's one of the first and the one of the largest, uh, or at least one of the most famous um, um, supply chain, uh, cyber supply chain attacks that, that has happened. Okay, if we take a look at the actual supply chain attack um, and, and what it is. So the terminology says that there needs to be, it needs to be a combination of two attacks. First is that uh, the supplier is attacked so that the attacker can gain access to the supplier's systems, let's say, and then the target is then uh, attacked or, or, or access through the suppliers uh, infected systems or, or compromised systems and and that makes it a, a supply chain attack or sub, uh, and and it's important to understand that if if it's just one of them it's it's just a kind of a software attack or or it's it's a um, um, it's um kind of a, a cyber attack which utilizes uh, uh, just uh, software or any other vulnerability. Okay, so what the report uh, states is that 66% um, <clears throat> uh, of the attacks uh, studied focused on suppliers code. Well, that's interesting, yes, and it's, it's well, it's, but it's, I would say it's not surprising. Uh, 50, and also 58% is, is, is aimed to access the data. Uh, but then 62% was based on a trust, uh, customer trust uh, or a supplier trust. And, and that's more interesting because that's something you kind of, uh, that's info you acquire, let's say from open sources or whatever. So, so that's something that, you know, it, it, it's very hard to tackle that one. Uh, and then 62% Two percent of the attacks rely on malware, and uh, um, and and that's something actually that we can yes maybe even or that we can uh, that's the most I would say easiest one to tackle although it's hard but still it's kind of if you compare it to the trust issue or or the trust case it's 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 more practical and then we have uh, from uh, the partner. Um, a supply chain leadership trends, uh, uh, um, snaps of, of it. And what is interesting here is that the digital first supply chains are the most kind of one of the th three trends currently this year, which means that the supply chains are getting more digitalized, which is, which is kind of also increases the cyber security risks. So, so uh, these won't at least are not going to go away. They will, will be, will be increase these kind of events that we we'll read on the papers. Okay, so what kind of other techniques there is? Of course, the first malware infection, that's kind of the uh, most common, uh, like we see from the, from the statistics. Then there's social engineering, brute force attack. These are kind of, uh, they has been there and are still exploiting software vulnerabilities that we hear uh, a lot, exploiting configuration vulnerabilities. Well, that can be human or that can be uh, a human error or it can be, you know, uh, deliberate, so to say, um, physical attacks and, and modifications of physical hardware. Uh, that's especially when you talk about uh, uh, when things are delivered, when hardware or, or any other physical uh, products are um, transferred, delivered, there is a chance of physical attack in this case. Also, it can be in the organization if someone in, uh, gets into your organization and, and does things. Uh, open source, that's very like currently a hot topic, o open source, OSINT stuff. Uh, there is loads of information available from every uh, every people or every person in, in in the in the world and then kind of this you can use that very efficiently to kind of uh, create profiles and use this info to to uh, attack uh, the organizations 
and then the old and new um, USB and any other portable media. So they are still a threat. You cannot live without them, it seems, and, and they are very handy and you just need to live with them. But uh, we need measures to kind of how to cope with the threat they pose. Okay, so the Cassia case was, was the, well, at least, well, let's say most recent of the biggest um, supply chain, cyber supply chain attacks there was. And uh, uh, this is also from the ENISA uh, threat landscape survey. So for the supplier, the case was that uh, they had uh, uh, this kind of VCA uh, uh, software or application service they provide for their customers all over the world. And that was uh, attacked by the attacker. And uh, as they got the malware, uh, which they impl implemented, or when they got the access to the VSA software, which was kind of uh, used to provide these kind of uh, um, connections all over the world, the customers, then it was kind of easy for them to access also the customer, the uh, place, the malware for customer systems. So, uh, like the report says, there are kind of, um, the attack techniques used was to, as a, for supplier, exploiting software vulnerability, and for the customer, it was using the kind of uh, supplier customer trust Relation, trusted relationship to infect the malware. Uh, so, so, and we have read, I think you all have read this uh, um, from the papers and, and news medias that uh, how this turned out. Okay, so what's also interesting in the report is that there is still a large number of unknown factors in these kind of incidents that they have investigated. So, uh, even up to 66% of the, let's say, attack vectors, so what kind of methods they use to attack the systems, are still unknown. And the question is how we can decrease the risk, so how we can handle the unknown, and of course also the things that are known, the attacks that were de detailed. So what you can do is, key takeaways are, use trusted sources. So whenever you do, uh, download something up, updates or software, whatever, uh, it's important to use trusted sources. Um, you, uh, it's important to verify every time the software integrity. So, so you need to, you know what software you're downloading uh, and, 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 and it, so that it, it is what it's supposed to be. There is nothing additional in it. Uh, limit the attack surface. Uh, so that there is a uh, minimum amount of uh, um, kind of um, things that the attackers or malicious actors uh, can get their hands to. So, so um, and also scan all the content you transfer. So you do not just check that kind of, okay, uh, it's, it seems that it's what it's supposed to be, but also you scan it for content, malicious content. Uh, in the supply chain, that's very important. <clears throat> and then perform effective provider and also third party management. Uh, so let's look what these mean and, and what kind of things uh, these contain. Well, first, what it means to use trusted sources is to kind of use software repositories that you have identified and verified somehow. So many times it's so that, uh, as I see in the customers, that when you need some, some kind of software package, software update, whatever, you just grab it from somewhere in the internet and put it kind of uh, to your systems and, and are happy that it works, but you don't necessarily know that is it actually kind of the real thing or is it if you take it somewhere, untrusted source, you don't know what it contains, some additional stuff. So when you think of the sources, of course you have vendors that can be chosen, uh, like let's say business software, what VPN, what RDP, like remote connection software use, etc. But then you of course have vendors that you can, can't choose. 
like if you use Microsoft Windows in your organization, kind of it's it's more or less mandatory. So kind of you need to just use it, but you need to make sure, of course, that when you download Microsoft updates, you download it from a trusted source and you verify it. And also hardware. So if you have HP, you have Dell or whatever hardware you have, you need to have uh, firmwares and whatever to these devices or, or storage or whatever. And you need to, of course, have them updated. So it's important to categorize the sources, which is critical, which is less critical, and also verify the source authenticity. And one way of doing this is, is of course, that you always verify the server certificate, like in the picture, so you know that it's a trusted source. There are many other means, but I would say this is the most important, that you verify that it's a trusted source. Okay, then it's very important to verify the integrity of the files. So <clears throat> you can do that by checking the checksums or hashes of the software. And, and even more, when you check it, like in the picture you have here, Windows update or actual language pack, and you, I have checked there, uh, the checksum of it, it says SAW256 and the checksum, and I can verify then the one way of doing it is, is that, or the typical way of doing it is that you check from the source web page for every way where you download stuff, you check the hashes from there. But the problem in that is that um, the hashes, if, if, if there is something malicious in it, uh, it's not, it's very possible that also the web page that you look the hash from has also been infected or, or, or you know, um, uh, compromised, which means that the hash is also changed to the web page. So of, it seems valid, but actually the hash has been changed or the file has been changed. So that, that, taking that into consideration, it's very important, if possible, to use some other channel to check or, or, or transport the checksum or, and the hash than the same channel that you download the software from or the update from. And, and that's why, why there are means of doing this. So, uh, and then this is like all about trust of, of the supplier and the between the trust and the cust, uh, customer or, or, or end user. <clears throat> okay, then um, you want to limit the attack surface. This is kind of an old but still valid, valid argument. So we want to decrease the network visibility, especially when we talk about internet <coughs> visibility. <coughs> Sorry. So if possible, avoid direct internet access. So that's always a risky thing, although it's many times mandatory, but still limited as, as limited as possible uh, to, to disallow direct, if, if there is some vulnerability or, or, or something that the attackers can uh, use to compromise the systems, it's still kind of limited. So there is, you know, you don't get your, uh, these malicious actors to all of your organization or corporate network. Uh, it's very important to keep the systems patched. So you have working patching routines. Um, that helps a lot, even though, let's say in the case of a cyber supply chain attack, it not necessarily help but it's part of the puzzle. So it's, it's a combination of different things, many things, and one important thing is to have this. And to test the updates before implementing them to production. So never to put it straight without testing it to production. So, and then, because this might help in, in you in this case that you might see something uh, unexpected behavior in testing which is related to this kind of implemented uh, malicious uh, software or components or, or backdoors or whatever. Of course, it's not a total solution, but, but it helps. And also it, it restricts that the attackers don't have a 
direct connection to the actual operating systems if they get the, the connections compromised. Okay, then to sanitize the content. So <clears throat> you have limited the visibility, you have verified the sources, uh, you have even um, uh, done some some integrity check for the for the uh, let's say hashes and stuff, and you have maybe even trust for the sources. But then still, uh, you don't you want to make sure that you, what you transfer is doesn't contain anything malicious because even like we said, if the kind of the checksums hash values are correct seem correct they might still contain something that is not supposed to be there so that's why it's important to identify and protect the software um, channels that you use to import your let's say update for example and also manual methods which was one of the attack methods in the in the enisa survey and that was for example portable media so also uh, include all all the channels that there is and and identify it and and, and kind of uh, make sure that these are used they, and also that they are usable um, <clears throat> scan that software which you transfer for malware and also these advanced persistent threats which are more advanced targeted um, um, attacks uh, not based on necessarily on on just one or two uh, public available uh, vulnerabilities and and exploits made for them and then when you scan it sanitize it so clean it uh, scan it uh, as, as as and scan and sanitize it with as much uh, wide coverage as possible which means that uh, that okay if you use one scanner let's say antivirus scanner um, that that does something and but but if and, and that that gives you some kind of coverage but let's say if you use 20 or 30 it gives you a totally different kind of coverage uh, and and that's that's kind of the new thing and, and uh, which you can can get much more protected than than currently maybe you are or 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 are planning to be um and you can sanitize so there is still a possibility if there is malware you can still try to clean it uh and still use it of course not always but at least it gives you the possibility uh to be you know let's say you have a vulnerability in your production environment or systems that prevents um uh, it let's say uh, to use it uh, so because there are vulnerabilities which you don't want to put online let's say it's an e-commerce uh, uh, service so you might have a possibility to to kind of uh, get away with uh, and you need a software update but but there seems to be a malware in it or you you know the scanning says that don't there is something wrong with it but you can try to sanitize it with the decent decent um, solutions to to be still able to use it and if possible also identify hidden uh, data uh, hidden uh, software uh, whatever uh, in those files that you transfer to your organization import from your vendors or, or service providers or whatever what they uh, send you so steganography is, is the art of, of, of hiding stuff into another files so that they cannot be seen. And, and, and usually, normally, let's say for antivirus scanners, they, they don't detect it. So you need specialized uh, solutions to do that. So that's important also and if possible use cdr which is content disarm and reconstruction so let's say if you have um, a critical let's say documents you import to the organization uh, from a vendor or something agreements whatever and 
and you want to make sure that in your critical infrastructure you don't input anything that is you know contains something malicious you can change it with this content disarm you disarm the content uh, totally and reconstruct it again to have a totally new but still kind of a new file let's say in a different format but you still can use it and open it let's say it's a pdf you can or word document or whatever you can open it as a pdf or a picture so that's kind of what is cdr and and, and it's a very effective way to avoid steganography <clears throat> then uh important very important is to manage the third parties so uh how you control the all kind of software vendors and, and uh, any kind of other uh, service providers. One way of doing this is, is or well, is secret contract. So to have a set of baseline of requirements that you you want or, or obligate from these vendors, it's not always, of course, possible because let's say big uh, international companies might or are usually kind of uh, reluctant of signing these, but still you can at least try and uh, have in some sort of level agreed baselines that said how you contact your, how these vendors and then uh, contact your uh, organization uh, systems services how they maintain them and what kind of uh, channels they use uh, what kind of authentication methods are needed to allow that and, and you can guide them based on this kind of baseline to to more secure ways of, of managing or, or providing software so this is where security contracts come into play uh, also Avoiding, like I said already, avoiding uh, connecting critical servers directly to internet. That's that's very important. Um, and also uh, controlling and limiting third-party access to internal resources. So it's it's never a good idea to allow a vendor to connect directly to systems in your intranet or in your um, data storage or whatever uh, internal. Uh, internal environment so it's always good to have some kind of uh, control in a gateway secure gateways in between or you have a uh, uh, jump host or these sort of things um, and to use strong authentication which is called also multi-factor authentication this limits also the possibility to overcome the authentication by someone else, because usually these are based on, on, on certificates and things that you, it's, it's harder to, to uh, counter. And also when you, when you have connections to your externally to your systems, uh, limit the possibility to use those systems to jump to others. So we talk about horizontal movement. So that's of course one way of doing it is, is, is segmenting and isolating um, systems and environments. But there are also the authentication and authorization uh, helps a lot to do this. Of course, today people are or an organizations are connected to clouds and then these kind of uh, organizational boundaries are not that clear, but still you can can do these kind of things also in the cloud. It's just a bit different perspective, but it's still possible. It's just a bit different means. Okay, so now that we talked about the five cases here, uh, how we can how we can counter the threat of a cyber secure um, supply chain cyber attacks. Uh, it's good to see one kind of setup 
of of uh, of uh, this kind of um, implementation that which is fictional but it's still from a real life and uh, in this picture you have here in the left upper part uh, you have internet you need to get updates to all kind of different Linuxes and, and Windows and whatever to your infra, which in this case seems to be a heating and a, and a water um, plant. And, and you want to get the updates there. And also you need to have third party connections to maintain these, these systems, to monitor them. Uh, or it can be, of course, internal also, but in this case, it's 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 third party, which looks and have some kind of um, um, operational center, which they look these these the operation of these plants, and in between you you have your internet, which is of course the the uh, organizational IT, so to say. Then you have. Uh, uh, transfer pipes, so to say. So these are actually solutions that help you and make sure that whatever you transfer through these are scanned and sanitized. Uh, so, uh, and also integrity checked, the source uh, certificate checked, and also the checksum and the has of the transferred mm, updates are, are verified. And then in the other pipe, you have these secure remote uh, desktop connections to your plants, or it can be any other organizational asset that you want to monitor and access remotely. So, and how we have done it in this case is that we have our data diodes here, which are one-way physical devices, which with additional features that, that help you to, or, enable it to transfer files, the updates to these plants, but also that we scan and sanitize the files with up to 30, 30 AV scanners, antivirus scanners. We can remove hidden data, the steganography, and we can verify the sources and integrity of the, of the files. And in the other part, we have our zone card, which, which provides a limited, um, like stripped down RDP connections, high secure connection to these plants to monitor them. And what we have uh, here is, is that um, Magnus will, will show us, uh, Magnus, are you uh, kind of uh, listening or are you there? Can Magnus hear us? Hi, yeah. good. So Magnus will show us the, the uh, how this looks like a demo device uh, live, and um, and uh, we can then after that discuss on if you have questions on on about the demo and then please um, ask. It's 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 um it's um a live system, uh, but we have uh, of course recorded uh, recording that Magnus will talk through. So if you are wondering why he's pausing stuff, it's just that it's a recorded demo, but still uh, still kind of live. Okay, you take yeah. it, Magnus. So, hello, I'm Magnus Kulstrom from Advenica. I'm, I'm working here as a senior solutions engineer, and it's sort of part of my duties to do this customer implementations. But basically the demonstration that I'll be showing this uh, three-part demonstration. So uh, the setup that Sami went through initially uh, consists of uh, just a regular file transfer when you are basically transferring file, uh, files to your protected environment through this uh, solution that Sami presented where the files are scanned in the middle part of the solutions and if deemed uh, clean, then they are sent over to the safe site for trusted handling afterwards. Second part of the demonstration will be uh, by using a kiosk solution. So when you have USB remo removable media, for example, and the same 
set with that. And lastly, I'll be showing the RDP connection through our secure zone guard gateway, which basically creates an RDP uh, portal for user to connect through to the other side safely and with protocol breaks and RDP mitigations on the way. <clears throat> so if I'll start on the first demonstration, so firstly we have a, some kind of a files that we need to transfer to the other side. Uh, so these are kind of miscellaneous, miscellaneous, miscellaneous files that are set to the file transfer folder. And uh, there's a data diode on the first perimeter of the network, basically pulling the SFTP2 folder here, picking up any files it detects from here and sends them through the data flow to the middle part. So as we see, the files have disappeared. So then we'll move to the middle part, which is the scan engine. And in this case, uh, in our solution, we are using MetaDefender OpsWAT. Opswat Meta Defender uh, scanning engine, which consists of maximum at the moment 32 uh, simultaneous and antivirus engine scannings, and the other features that Sami also presented previously CDR and content disarmament, reconstruction, and DLP and vulnerability scanning. So as we, as, we, as we can see, the same files that we sent previously over to the uh, initial side are have landed to the middle part, and it has sort of made some kind of a scanning results of those already. So there we can see, for example, the, uh, some of them were infected and some were vulnerable. So the vulnerability scanning engine detected that the potida.exe that we were transferring over that we need to need to have on the other side for, for example controlling network device um, correction <clears throat> vulnerable so and from the scanning side we can see that there is uh, some founding findings uh, regarding the files so some of the files were deemed quite high on the cvss Based score ranking, so they won't, we would probably take some consideration on using that file. And uh, there were actually one infected file uh, included in the files trans transferred over, and it had a custom tro Trojan backdoor installed in it. And as we can see, that we did the scanning with eight uh, initial antivirus engines, and only three of those found anything from the file. So this makes the point basically that using only a specific one antivirus scanning doesn't give you sort of 100% coverage of everything, every malware that could be uh, coming through to your system. So having multiple antivirus engines doing the scanning at the same time uh, increases your sort of a chances of getting the bad stuff coming through. And then there's one file that's still in progress and we can refresh it and it has sort of gone through. So this is an example of a file that has uh, is deemed benevolent. So nothing has been found in it. So all of the engines are showing green. <clears throat> and if you go to the destination side, so this is the folder where the files has end up on the destination side. So this could be done technically in, in many different ways, but this is just a simple SFTP transfer to the destination. So files have appeared here. And as we can see from the timestamps that they are uh, at the time quite current. So I haven't planted anything here beforehand. And we can see also that the two files that were captured in the middle or so detected as vulnerable and malicious actually haven't transferred to true but there has been sort of a notification of the something being wrong or missing by sending a zero bit file over to the other side so the user or the end, end user or customer can sort of detect that okay maybe this hasn't come through so it has been caught in the middle and maybe i need to contact someone to discuss and see what ha has happened actually
Yeah, so the next demonstration would be the uh, kiosk solution. So in this case, we have a, the other user has a removable, removable media that he, he wishes to use on the safe side, but the uh, security policy, for example, dictates that you are not allowed to use USB media from external sources inside our network. So basically you need a way to transfer the data directly to the safe side and so it can be trusted again. The kiosk collusion is basically uh, a device that just uh, scans the files. There's a possibility of doing an initial uh, AV scanning for the files. If nothing found, those files can be then continued to process and compressed into a zip file and sent over to the file security screener process for further scanning. So nothing has been found and the device is complete. You can remove the media and now it's ready to serve new customers. Again, so the next next guy can come in. And as, as we can see, we are in the middle part again where the antivirus scanning is actually happening. So we see nothing yet. So once we come here and refresh it, then we can see that the file actually that has been taken from the USB media has come over and has been scanned already. This is actually really fast scanning uh, when done with th this kind of a file. Uh, it, the file name has some identification of the user in, uh, well, in, in, and in, in this use case, the identification is used on further on, on the data flow when it's actually reaching the end user itself. <clears throat> so as we can see, nothing found. File is clean and we are going to the destination. Uh, the destination requires a bit of an expl explanation here. So basically the, this workflow has been done so that the end user, in this case, Dennis Utilize, receives the files that he has sent with the USB stick uh, as an email attachment to the other side. This is, of course takes the requirements of limiting the file size so that it can be handled by email attachments or there could be other measures to transfer the file. But yeah, as we see uh, shortly, the file arrives as an email to the user. So he is now free to use the file as trusted and scanned uh, data from external sources, but something that we have, we can use with high confidence that there shouldn't be anything um, additional to it. Yeah. So, um, and lastly, the RDP demonstration for our secure portal zone guard. So in this case, we'll, uh, we'll be doing the last part of the picture that Sami saw where the uh, end user is taking RDP connection through the RDP uh, enabled zone guard device in a secure manner. <clears throat> so we connect to the zone guard portal and we sign in with our username. And now we are logging into the zone guard device itself. So this is the portal view of the device and we have all the endpoints that are available to our user to jump further to available here. So for example, we can in this case take the water PLC Stockholm connection, authenticate against that endpoint again and have the connection initialized. So yeah, here we have the PLC uh, management available to us and we can do the regular maintenance task for the PLC connection and change the water pressure levels and control the valves and manually turn off the valves when there's necessity, for example, to em empty the current tank and al alter the processes so the, the production requirements are met at the moment.
Yeah, so this is mostly just an RDP connection, so we will be disconnecting it from the RDP session as usual. And next up will be basically, we can take a second second jump host from here and take a connection to there. Uh, it, it, it is also, also possible to have multiple simultaneous connections through this, so that that's not limited, but in this demo demonstration we will be showing connections only one by one. And we have connection to the second PLC, which is uh, the heating part of the current system is handled from, and we can change the temperature levels from here on. And see the thermometer, observe the changes that the environment will take once we have some kind of changes in the processes through this secure management channel. And the temperature rises as, as supposed. And this is basically what the RDP connection does uh, as it base as, as it's supposed to. It 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 um, mitigates the any sort of vulnerabilities that you would have in RDP connection going through completely to the destination system. You strip you will be stripped out of the copy and paste and clipboards and all of those additional features the RDP might have it itself, and we're just using the basic functionality needed to control the destination process, and thus sort of mitigating also any additional vulnerabilities that would be included by using regular RDP. Thank you, Magnus. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so, if we can still kind of get back to the demo setup, I could say a few words about it. So hopefully you can see it now. So kind of we demo two cases. First was to how to in this kind of supply chain scenarios or in you know, any kind of uh, file import uh, scenarios, uh, use high secure file transfer method. And, and how it's in this use case, these two use cases use, and also how we can have remote or third-party connections secured through this, this solution that we showed. This is one way of doing it. Uh, the important way, important thing is to have a gatekeeper here, whatever it is, but uh, to you know, identify validated connections and you know who is contacting and you know where you transfer your files and you verify them. So, so that's that's the message that I want to give from this this presentation. Um, maybe um, uh, Johanna, you can take it to have. Maybe we have questions or yeah. Thank you so much for this presentation, Sam and Magnus. It was really interesting and very. Uh, nice to see a demo as well. Uh, yes. We have one question here. Uh, what are the most critical customer pain points at the moment? Well, from my perspective, maybe Magnus can also add mm -hmm. his view, but is is definitely handling these vendor connections and also importing files securely. Uh, no matter what means to organizations. So, so mm. especially if it's if it's something you know, because um, business operations and day-to-day -day activities is is very kind of uh, changing. So you need to act fast, and you need to ha have info in data in from different kind of sources. So you need to have versatile and secure manners of transferring things in and use the files fast. So, so and and currently if there are some manual methods or, or varying methods or whatever, that of course is, is a high, uh, makes it very high risk, it makes it risky, those procedures. And it, it might end up in that something malicious gets into your systems and you're compromised and you're in problems. Mm -hmm. mm. 
you move the Magnus add yeah. something. Yeah, all automation is the key word today. So having an automated process for sort of a handling the updates or having a flow of updates into a system which work automatically and securely and you can sort of rely on those afterwards. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, do we have any more questions here? Let me check. No, if you have a question, please uh, write it now in the chat and we'll read it up. But as it looks now, uh, we don't have any more questions. No. Uh, and no. Do you have anything you else to add, Sammy or Magnus? Yeah, of course, you can reach us, us um, afterwards also if there is something to discuss or we can happily help and uh, uh, answer questions also afterwards, yeah. so so no worries. Okay, yeah. super. Uh, there are no more questions at the moment, so, uh, okay. but you can always find us on our website and contact us there. So if you have anything, as Sami said, just, just write to us after. So thank okay. you so much, Sami and Magnus, really interesting. And uh, for everyone listening, we'll see you some other time at another webinar. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.